everybody. Today is the 25th of March 2021. We've just had St. Patrick's Day in Ireland, a very different St. Patrick's Day given the situation with COVID worldwide. So we're, we're very, very grateful that everybody is joining in today. We lost the oh, here she is. Yeah. Okay. Back again. Yeah, yep. you can see me, Ronan. Yep. And um, this is a consortium of individuals uh, from UCD, uh, NUI, um, National University uh, of Ireland, um, ADHD Ireland, Ken Kilbride, and Andrew Eddy in Neurodiversity Hub in Australia. And just to put a context on it, the UCD Neurodiversity Project, which started in UCD in uh, just in 2020, led by uh, Dr. Blona Gavin from Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. The working group at the moment is Beth Kilkenny, Timmy Frawley, Tom Flanagan and Clean O'Connor. And really, we're very, very excited about this project as we are beginning to link with other universities. We've taken our lead from the seminal work carried out by Professor Lawrence Fung Young in Stanford University and uh, we're, we're delighted to be in this space. Um, the reason we're having these master classes is really to begin and continue, begin perhaps for us, uh, but continue a conversation about neurodiversity and really to share knowledge and experiences and perhaps even to share lack of knowledge in a safe space that will allow us to understand better and improve the lives for many of us who are in fact neurodiverse. I'm delighted today to be uh, welcoming and having a discussion, a conversation with uh, somebody I've come to know, well, uh, over a long period of time, but hopefully Ronan will get to know you a, a lot better over the coming uh, years. But delighted to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Ronan McGovern. Uh, Ronan, to set the scene, I understand you're in Dublin because you're not normally in Dublin yeah. these days. No, I just, I've been in Stanford quite a bit, but today I'm in Dublin, yeah. Right. So just for the audience, and uh, we'll get back to the topic you're talking about, but just can you say a little bit by way of introducing yourself? And uh, yes, so you I grew, yes, so I grew up with what's called combined type ADHD, um, but I knew nothing about it until I arrived at Stanford Business School. And when I was in my first maybe few weeks of Stanford Business School, uh, my classmate, who was pretty much a medical expert, she kind of said to me, based on my presentation in class, she suspected I had ADHD. So that's where I got diagnosed. Um, fast forward, to, so I've, I've been working in the AIB Bank, but if you fast forward from when I was at the business school in 1996 until 2019, uh, I was asked by Lawrence Fung to work as a scholar at the Neurodiversity Project at the medical school for mm. six months so it was a very different experience than at the business school but i'd say i learned a lot about the science and the the neuroscience and the the thinking well it just i learned a lot about my brain and the brain just generally and how important it is in terms of how you are in your life and how you relate in your life the more you understand about your brain the better so i think uh, i was very fortunate because of my unusual background that i was asked to, to do the work so when I was at the medical school, I did a lot of advocating with both companies in the States and also with uh, the, the various departments at Stanford. So take us back up a little. And um, my own inattentiveness has led me to not introduce myself. So I apologize. <laughs> and um, my, my name is Fiona McNichtis. I'm a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist and professor in UCD. Um, I won't disclose whether I've ADHD or not, that's for you to guess, but for those of us, I work with uh, young people with ADHD, but can you describe to us a little bit uh, what is ADHD? I know yep. you said it was a late diagnosis, Ronan, you received, so yep. how can that be? Because most people associate it with children. Yeah, I think um, I was just got lucky because in the class that I was admitted to, and in the year I was admitted to Stanford Business School, there happened to be a medical expert in my class, so I was very fortunate. But I would say it's probably true that 
in my generation, I suspect maybe 90, I don't know, 97% of the people did not get diagnosed. Now that's different today. And I would say as well, it's very similar. In my experience, the medical school is very similar that people in my generation in the States, maybe 10%, the most affluent families, they got their kids diagnosed. Um, but nowadays, there's a much higher degree of diagnosis and awareness in the States than there was in my generation. But yeah, so I was just really lucky that, you know, like a lot of my ancestors, I should have gone to my grave not, never knowing I had ADHD. So I was just really lucky. Mm. Do you or think probably, it's friends and family? Or, yeah, I think and they families? say it's... Yeah, I think it's eight, isn't it? They say it's eighty percent genes. It's um, eighty percent possibility comes through genes. Okay. I think so. Mm -hmm. And now the the piece I can never fully understand is that some people at Stanford say that you know ten percent I think is caused by the environment, but as somebody with ADHD, I could never understand how it could be possibly caused by the environment because to me it's such a thing that's that feels part of my system that. I couldn't understand how it could how it could come in from the outside. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I guess that's where it might come down to the concept of diagnostic, you know, uh, considerations. If you're talking that ADHD equals a number of symptoms, you can conceive how that might happen post head injury, you know, post yeah. uh, oh, infection. Yes. So, so yes. that you might have that cluster of symptoms that people oh, feel yeah. meet a criteria, and then maybe medication. And Maybe, yeah. is useful. But going back to the ADHD as you understand it, because I guess this yeah. is all about um, the, the experience of the individual and how, you know, whilst there may be a name for something, it's very different for different people. So mm. what are the sorts of difficulties that you might attribute with that ADHD idea? And mostly importantly, what are the sorts of strengths that you might link with it? Yeah, well, just in terms of the challenges, just with combined type ADHD, there's two types. So I'm primarily challenge, challenged by two things. Firstly is inattention. And the second thing is impulsivity. So impulsivity, I like to think of as, as, as the kind of the physical manifestation. You know, you see a child jumping around the place, very active. That's the impulsive part. And then the inattentive part for me is just the constant, you know, moment to moment uh, distraction. And in terms of strength, go back to strengths because it's kind of linked. I can now understand that my brain, the part of my brain that's incredibly creative, the way I look at it is that the flip side of that is, you know, the, in the inattentive. So I think there's a relationship between my idea generation and my inattention. So here's the thing, if the universe or God asked me, Roland, you know, you have a choice here. I'm going to give you a gift of creativity, but the downside is that uh, you're going to be inattentive. I take it. So it's like one to okay. me is like the flip side of the other. Uh, in terms of gifts, yeah, the main is, well, I'd say creativity. And the second one is just the ability to consume massive amounts of data from different domains and link them up and, and uh, integrate different domains. So that's very, very useful. Mm. And to consume a huge amount of data and information and be able to summarize in a short number of points. Now, the only downside to that is that it's a bit like I can do that, but if I do that for half an hour, I get tired. And I need a 15 minute break. So it does when I'm in that when I'm in that mode of doing that kind of work, like maybe a half an hour at most before I need a break. It seems mm -hmm. to it seems to draw on all the regions of my brain. I remember talking to one neuroscientist. She was telling me that when you're in the use of your creative side, that it it she was telling me that it draws on all the sides of the and the regions of your brain so it's like it's, i suppose it's no wonder you're tired because it's really it's really your whole brain regions are being exercised so if you work at caltech and i was pretty that was the first time i ever heard about that really mm. Mm. so, so going back strange. to what you said is that yeah, inattention would have been one of the challenges for you, and you was and impulsivity was the other, and you associate for yourself that impulsivity was kind of linked with that hyperactivity. Because yeah. I guess for the people watching, there are a number of people who are zooming in who are probably thinking, 
our tradition and understanding of ADHD is that triad that you've mentioned, difficulties with attention, difficulties with impulsivity and difficulties with hyperactivity, being unable yeah. to settle. Yeah. Um, and the, the flip side for that is that, and again, it's so important to know that somebody can concentrate, but it may be at the expense, as you said, of, you know, exhaustion. You know, you can yeah. do it all that data for half an hour, yeah. but yeah. then you get exhausted. Yeah, and I think the other thing is yeah. that, the, the other thing is that even the word, or even the word, like even the term attention deficit is actually factually incorrect because people with ADHD like myself, it's like you pay attention to everything that's going on. So you're on massive, it's like you're perceiving everything in your environment. So it's not like a deficit at all. So the response of people like me to, let's say, my brain, like basically being turned on in all the regions is that we hyper-focus. So mm -hmm. the way I get, the way I get things, things done is I literally tunnel vision what's the one thing I need to get done in the next 20 minutes. And then mm -hmm. I just, and then I just, it's like, a, you know, a, a 60 yard dash sprinter. Mm -hmm. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the way I operate. It's, it's a series of never ending sprints where mm -hmm. I devote mm -hmm. my, all my attention to one thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit, Ronan, because as you're speaking, I hear very much that you have adapted and developed a lot of strategies that allow you to actually optimize those strengths. Yeah. And, you know, um, make, make sure that they don't become problematic. And yeah. um, just in terms of the late diagnosis, you were kind of in, in Stanford during your MBA. Yeah. And this came as a, did it come completely as a shot out of the dark? Or well, did it explain things when you got it? Yeah, so here, I mean, when, I, when, my, when my classmate asked me, I think the way she approached me, she said, Ron, have you ever heard of ADHD? And I said, no. And I said, what is it? And then she began to explain it. And I didn't know, this was 90, this was April 96. And I'd never heard of ADHD. But then when she began to explain what ADHD is, I said, God, that sounds like me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then what ultimately happened is over a series of two weekends, I went to a, a, a local Palo Alto uh, educational psychologist for two series of tests or about, I think about five hours each. And then it was actually, it, it just, my diagnosis it was about a 10 page summary of all the tests with the diagnosis mm -hmm. of combined type ADHD, which means both the inattentive and the impulsive side. So once Ina, my classmate explained to me about ADHD, I said, oh, that's really interesting. And then I suppose when I got diagnosed maybe two weeks later, then I began to say, oh my God, when we began to see what ADHD is and the, and the results of my tests, I then began to look back on my life and put together all kinds of jigsaws about that explains that, that explains that, that explains that. Um, so yeah, I, I um, yeah, that it helped me put the jigsaw of my life together. And sometimes it helped me forgive myself for things that I might have impulsively done without intentionally meaning to do them. Mm -hmm. And just as the chats are coming in, there's a recognition as you're describing this, that other people People are beginning to recognize as an adult uh, that they themselves may have had yeah. ADHD. Yeah. And, and I think in the literature, the scientific literature, we're aware, you know, that there's an increasing amount of diagnosis now being made among adults. Yeah. Not that it's new onset, that still isn't something that people are convinced can happen that, yeah. you know, you had none of these yeah. difficulties until adulthood. So there, there's still that sense of it being a developmental yeah. difference along the way. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd say in my case, like I was in my 30s when I got diagnosed, but without me knowing it, I was subconsciously developing, let's say, 500 different coping mechanisms, right, for, for functioning in life. Um, but even what's interesting is that despite my 500 fun coping mechanisms, that my classmate was able to diagnose me just by looking at me in class. So, mm. so I would say today... I'd be curious to see where we'd go back in history and with me the way I am now. I, I suspect you wouldn't be able to see it because I've become so, so, well, I suppose I should say that my life did change about three years ago. I took, uh, I took, uh, sorry, I'm just, there's a good example of my inattention gone. I was just watching a chat. 
Oh, sorry. So in, <laughs> 2000, in 2015, um, I was I took medication for the first time. I changed everything, changed my whole life. Right, right, right. So I, I would say I... that the good thing about I I intentionally didn't take the medication when I was first diagnosed, but I would recommend. Here's the thing. I think I had a very challenging life because I opted not to take medication. The benefit of not taking medication until three years ago was that it forced me to exercise muscles that other people would have said, listen, you've ADHD, don't bother exercising that muscle. Do you know what I mean? So I think I developed strengths in areas where I shouldn't really have strengths as somebody with ADHD. So then when I eventually came to take the medication three years ago or four years ago, then it was like that was the last little bit left because I'd done all the work, all the hard work. Now, that's not to say, mm. yeah. We often it, talk in. Yeah. So I'm going to say, if you want to last thing, just if you're a parent today and you're saying, you ask me, oh, should I get my child? My child has been diagnosed. Should I take medication? It's kind of a much easier life just getting the medication. And I'm probably at school, you probably do much better. Um, but I, I had the advantage mm. of never having taken it but I'm not sure I'd recommend anybody else. Yeah. So in child psychiatry, we often talk about the importance of a multimodal approach to treatment. And you, oh, yeah. you kind of highlighted it there yourself. It's for those very reasons, Ronan, that, you know, the medication is very helpful yeah. in the immediate yeah. term. And it yeah. allows yeah. you, especially when the environment is a little bit rigid, like school is, and we'll come back to school and college. Yeah. I mean, all this is about... How do you change the system, you know, to facilitate yeah. uh, different learning styles? But the medication may be helpful in the short term, but the sorts of skills you've learned, like that bulking up of your muscles or whatever, yeah. you know, is so important as well. Yeah. You know, the yeah. coping strategies yeah. that you develop. Yeah. And um, in terms yeah. of before I move on again to some of those coping strategies, um. What you, your, your delayed diagnosis, if I can put it that way, was it was just opportunistic in that this colleague, this friend of yours in, in the MBA class noticed it and was aware of it. Yeah. So, you know, do, do you kind of think that, um, and you said that obviously that exists and we all know that that exists, that the first time an adult is often diagnosed is because their child comes to the attention. Do you think we're doing enough now to highlight the, both the continuous nature of ADHD into adulthood, but also this new recognition of a cohort. And so here's the thing, uh, Fiona, like I've great admiration for the medical people I've worked with and I've met in my journey. The truth is like, if I could wave my magic wand and get a government minister to say, okay, this is important enough to put a hundred million into it. Like I think, you know, this is why even Stanford has decided to prioritize neurodiversity because what Stanford has said, like in its brilliance, is said, you know, something, it's one thing whether, you know, whether gender diversity and racial diversity and all those other very important things, but underneath it all, how we're all wired to think is really important, really important, no matter what, what gender, no matter what uh, racial group. So, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, because of the experience of my own life, I would want, I would be a very strong advocate. And if I could somehow influence a government minister to put enough money into this so that the right, that there's a build up of the medical profession to do the work. Because when, I suppose I'm saying, Fiona, let's say, let's say by some amount of magic tomorrow, everybody in Ireland who has a neurodiverse condition is somehow magically, you know, has become aware of it, right? Let's say, like I did at the business school. Mm -hmm. But then I think we probably need, I don't know, you know, 200 extra psychologists or psychiatrists, psychologists in Ireland. So we need the whole thing to be funded. We need a proper place, proper support places. Now that's beginning to happen in America. Uh, there's awareness growing in America, but even in America, to be honest, it's still, it's not as big as it should be. Although it's definitely, getting much more attention in California. I can tell you that much for sure. So yeah, Fiona, I would be a big advocate of trying to improve awareness in society amongst adults, amongst every part of society and making it a priority of government. Because here's the thing, I think the stats in America is 
a lot of people with ADHD, for example, end up like, let's say, gambling addicts or alcoholics or in prison. So I know you can, there's economic studies to say, you know, something from the point of view of the government, it's far more economically worthwhile to fund diagnosis and treatment than it ever is to, let's say, treat people when they end up in prison or as alcoholics mm -hmm. or drug addicts. Mm -hmm. And I know yeah. I know there's research on that. Yeah, the cost saving of early intervention, you know, for every dollar you put in in, in primary or in, in preschool, you get back. But by the time you come to even sadly secondary school and you're talking about third level college and workplaces, you know, the return for your buck is very little. Ronan, tell me a little bit about um, your Stanford experience, both with Lawrence and then your own project. Right. Um, in the Stanford oh, Business School. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say the medical school literally, you know, I went over and when I got off the plane in San Francisco, the first thing I did was I met, I met Lawrence for something to eat in the Stanford shop, etc. And he said to me, Oh, Ron, and even after, let's say, 15 minutes of a conversation, he said, You know something, Ron, you really have to write your memoir so that this be what you've learned becomes freely available. So I hope to have that done by the end of this year. But okay. when I was in my six months there, basically every day I would come into the medical school and say, um, okay, what do I what what do I do today? And so usually I, I might end up contacting five companies and I would go and travel to speak to them or I would meet them. So I, I would make Airbnb, Google, Microsoft, like you name it. I just went out like Johnny Appleseed and explaining about neurodiversity, even based on my knowledge of the working on the lab, talk about my own life story and try to push neurodiversity awareness. So as I was saying, I probably met 150, maybe 200 companies in six months. And then the second part, so that was probably... 40% of my work was meeting companies. 40% of my work was advocating across Stanford seven schools. So engineering, psychology, business, law school, engineering. And so I met like a lot of people. And, you know, even though Stanford, I think is probably the most diverse place on earth. It's still, it's still on terms of, even though it's prioritized neurodiversity, it's still, you know, not as far as Stanford should be. You know, of course I have very high expectations but it's it's at least they've recognized it and they've kind of put it in their priorities. Now, when it comes to last year, so I came back to the bank after my six months work at the medical school. And then in June of 2020, I was asked by the business school, decided that they needed to, they wanted to try and change the world because the world is so, in such a bad place. So. What happened was they sent me out an email along with a lot of other people saying, as an alum, would you dream up a project to make society better? So I, I emailed them back and said, listen, I'm happy to do it. But I said, the only condition is I want to do it in the area of neurodiversity. So um, basically, I took another two months off, three months off my bank for June, July and August. And I started off with some ideas. And then I used to meet the business school every week by, by, by video. And then they give us all a kind of um, uh, some tools to work with. And so over what happened was over that period of the summer, I ended up recruiting 80 other volunteers and we produced a landmark report and that's contained on the, on the website, ND Gifts Movement. So, you know, 80 people, basically worked on me for the summer. Some people work, let's say, 10 hours a week, some 20 hours a week, some 30 hours a week. My two fellow co core team members were Tiffany Jamison and Susan O'Malley, who's also a, a Stanford Business School grad. And we did, a, we did this landmark report and we also collaborated with five tech companies. So Microsoft, LinkedIn, Google, Amazon, and Salesforce. So we, over the last summer, we were engaging with the diversity parts of those companies and also Bank of America and also my own bank, AIB. And we were promoting awareness in those companies uh, of neurodiversity. So I think we made, made an impact. Um, the, if you, you know, in case you're wondering why we didn't work with more, the truth was that 
the, 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 the project was structured as an innovation sprint. So we only had from June to the end of August. So collaborating and meeting regularly with five with those five companies was all we could really do because had we tried to work with another 10, we would have been completely overwhelmed. So that's led to a social movement, which is captured in our in our website called ND Gifts Movement. But it, it really started off with me taking up a kind of a, a call to action to do something to help make society better. And I, 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 think, I think there was a lot of other people did it as well, but my my project was cognitive diversity. Yeah. And I I won't say that was an impulsive response because I know it wasn't, but you can see how the impulsivity <laughs> and how ADHD individuals take on things that can lead yeah. to tremendous success. The big yeah. issue is yeah. balancing all those balls in the air. Yeah, I think you're and right. But in you're, terms yeah. Yeah, you're right, but it looked like I said the impulsivity. It was also because I knew this is my this is part of my life call, my purpose, you know. So it was impulsive, but it was also like it was like I was primed for it. And then when the email came in from the business school saying, Can you help make society a better place? I said, Okay, this is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, in terms of the uh, you mean somebody wants me to write okay, down the yeah, somebody's asked me the website's called ND Gifts Movement. Sorry, I, I, that was my intention. Okay, if you want to back with you. Yeah. And ND yeah. standing for neurodiversity. Yeah, gifts, gifts movement. Movement. Okay. Dot com. Yeah. Ronan, in terms of increasing awareness by focusing on it, uh, and no better place than Palo Alto, where you've yeah. all those high tech companies, yeah. do you think that they actually modified either their recruitment strategies or their environment? Now, I know Google was always a fantastic yeah. environment. I yeah. used to um, envy them with big bicycles and uh, fantastic yeah. uh, canteens. Yeah. Uh, of course, all of that was to encourage people yeah. to stay as long as they wanted it to work. But did yeah. they do practical things um, yeah. to change? Yeah. So I'll tell you a few things that I witnessed in my time was the the number one thing was some of them start to address intentional recruiting of neurodiverse people. Because it's like, let's say, take any group, whether it's been racial groups or ethnic groups or whatever, that nothing happens unless you have intentionally recruiting of people. Because if you don't get people into the river, they're never going to swim up the river. So mm -hmm. intentional recruiting is the first thing. The second thing is a lot of them have abandoned the, the formal interview because it's just not a good way of assessing somebody. Um, the next thing is uh, having tailored career paths that are different for neurodiverse people, uh, or at least that take into account the special gifts and challenges of neurodiverse people. Um, the next thing would be things like fitting the job role to the person. Uh, then it's then it goes down to evaluation. Then it goes down to making sure there's no bias in, in the system because biases are very strong. With but for example, with both recruiting agents and with HR people, there's a huge amount of biases. So you really have to think very carefully about those. And then the other thing I would say that Amazon do really well is there's these things called affinity groups, and the best companies have started affinity groups. Now. You've got to be careful because one company made a big mistake of have having what I would call separation. In other words, like okay, you know, all women over there, all your diverse people over there, all you know, and you, so you, you don't want that. So you want mm. people to be integrated into into a whole, but you know, it's like there's unity in diversity, but you don't you don't separate it. It's the, the unity is in the diversity, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so those those companies have done great things. There's a, a fantastic company called uh, Ultra Knots, Ult Ultra Knots, N A U T S. That was a, a great company. There's a, there's a great small little company called Mentra, and what Mentra does is it matches the skills of a of a person to the job fit of the person. Mm. They're only a growing tech company, but there's a lot of great small companies. And your diversity pathways. Mm. There's a company called Evo Libri, a very inspirational CEO there. There's a company called Lime Connects. But the best big companies are definitely Amazon, Microsoft, Salesforce, LinkedIn, and Google. They're, well, of course, they're the ones mm. I came across. And the other thing I'd say mm. is that 
Bank of America, um, Bank of America was surprisingly good. I mean, what really impressed me about Bank of America was that their neurodiversity strategy was being sponsored by the top management at the board down. And it, mm. it got formal. So it, everybody in the company knew neurodiversity is really important because the top management mm. are saying it's really important. So it's a bit like mm. saying, if somebody says, yeah, listen, race, if somebody from the top says racial diversity is really important, everybody says, oh yeah, we better, we better do something about that. That's really mm. important. And mm. it's the same for neurodiversity. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same for gender. It's mm. got to do with culture. Yeah. In, in terms of that uh, seminal report that you'd written as a result of that, um, it, you know, is that, do you think, going to be rolled out or how can other well, companies here in Ireland yeah. take that, what you've learned from that and start applying it to our own position? Yeah, what we've done is, uh, so there was eight of us, you'll see every chapter is written by maybe five or six authors. So of the eight of us, I suspect most of the 80 of us have written some of those chapters, but at the back of the report in an appendix is kind of, I think there's two different things. One is like a, there's a whole suggested, for any company that wants to try and start thinking about neurodiversity strategies, in the back of the report in the appendix is a whole list of bullet points about action. Here's your best actions if you want to try and implement neurodiversity. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think in, I, I know because I, I co-authored this, there's a chapter for companies who are a bit nervous about having a neurodiversity st strategy. What we did was we borrowed from the research of Stanford Business School, uh, which was based on companies who try to tackle and improve racial diversity, I think that, what they found was companies really made great progress in that area by, by adopting and implementing internships. So somebody says, okay, we're having an, an internship for three months for somebody from this community, from that community, somebody who's neurodiverse. So one of the things that uh, I definitely made me very happy was that, so that, that, that chapter, by the way, in internships is probably about three or four pages of suggestions mm -hmm. for somebody, but, the thing I personally took a lot of joy from was that maybe about three weeks or four weeks after our paper was published, Goldman Sachs announced neurodiversity internships. And over the summer, one Great. of my best one of my best friends is a partner at Goldman Sachs and he sits on the diversity committee. So he would have been in touch with me very regularly throughout the summer. So he mm. adopted, sponsored, and implemented a neurodiversity internship program at Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. but, so, and so we're going to come yeah. back to, to, towards the end, Ronan, and I might come back to where to next, but not yeah. just yet. Can I ask a little bit, you've spoken very, very um, powerfully there about the change that can happen within the workplace. And thinking about uh, the Stanford neurodiversity and you know their uh, attempts to infiltrate in a very positive way Academic yeah. learning as one of the Ivy League institutions, yeah. mentoring for students, yeah. awareness, providing yeah. signposts to appropriate services when they're needed. Yeah. Um, is there anything you know that um, you you and in your role there when you've been linking with them for the previous six months? Yeah. You know, was there anything that stood out? They, they did yeah. a number of pronged approaches. Yeah. To intervene. Yeah. Anything stands out above the other? Yeah. The thing that stood out for me was. We, there was a group of about 25 of us undertook this course under Dr. Fung's leadership. It's called uh, uh, Topics in Your Diversity, I think the class is called. It was for a quarter. And of the 25 of us, maybe 18 were undergrads of various disciplines. And there's probably three or four, four grad students. And then there was myself and maybe a couple other people. And we used to meet with Dr. Fung I think twice a week for about four hours. And mm -hmm. the, the whole idea was we were, the, the 25 of us were separated into four working groups. And each of the four, four working groups had to work on a project for the summer, for, for the quarter. So one, one, um, one group worked on, they, they developed a kind of a 60 page paper on accommoda accommodations for Stanford undergrads 
you know, uh, accommodations depending on whether it's dyslexia, ADHD, autism, whatever. So they comp they compiled a Bible that ended up going to the Stanford, you know, accommodations office that September. So I we did the work in the April, May, June of 2019. From the fall of 2019, that was implemented at Stanford for Stanford students who are near the rest. Okay. So that was immediate implementation. Mm -hmm. the immediate, second, immediate, immediate. Yeah. And then the second thing that was done by mm -hmm. another group in our group was there was something about, uh, you know, when undergrads first come to Stanford, there's all this thing about socialization and how you end up meeting each other and groups and all this. And so one of the feedbacks was, I think that was an area of challenge for Stanford undergrads. So what they did was this group, another group, they devised ways that Stanford could change the whole orientation and the socialization process. So again, that was a block of work, again, that was implemented by that body within Stanford that looks after that side of things. So orientation, you know, socialization, all that. So there are two things we're doing at Stanford that I know of. And then I know there was, I met a guy as well, and he was working on the design of Stanford University to make sure that that everybody somehow or other would meet everybody else and it'd be cross-functional. So I would say that's probably, I mean, there's probably nowhere better in the earth to be a New Adverse student than at Stanford because mm. the amount of work that's gone into both the accommodations, the the dorm life, the so the socialization, the orientation, and then down to things like the design of buildings. Everything is done, you know, what they call universal design. In other words, mm -hmm. that when you design something, let's say for somebody who's dyslexic or somebody who's whatever, that by designing a thing that's that's universal design, everybody benefits. And that was the whole thinking that once you do universal design everybody benefits, not just particular groups. But I don't, it might be unfair to expect, even in the States, like I think Stanford's the only university in the States that I know of who's so far ahead in this. Like I, 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 we used to get a lot of calls in the lab from various universities inquiring about how do we do it? And of course, a lot of it is down to, I mean, Dr. Fong was the person who went out and planted the flag. And I suppose mm. we're all charging in his, in his wake. Yeah. Well, well, it really comes back to the power of individuals and the changes they can make. I mean, you're an example of that, Ronan. Uh, and Lawrence Fung is an example, very committed and made such a huge amount of difference. We hope collectively by getting this group together, um, the uh, International Neurodiversity Group and the different projects within the universities that, you know, individual passion will have a bed that it's easy, yeah. you know, to allow things to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Coming think, back a little bit to sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm sorry for keep on cutting across you. No, I think the idea. Um, I think even, I think even Dr. Fung's idea was by getting me pe people like me. I was the first non-medic, I think, into the lab. But by getting people in advocates who can actually know what it is to have ADHD or dyslexia, or whatever, that actually then I can say in the class with the group that's doing, let's say, the accommodations, I'm able to say, well, actually. With somebody with ADHD, they need A, B, and C, D. Do you know? Mm. So yeah. it's like the advocacy, once you have the right, uh, I suppose, advocates and knowledge people, you can kind of spread the mission. Yeah. 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 Um, certainly in Ireland, with the DARE uh, access to um, college and uh, with, you know, modifications and accommodations in school, th there is a sense that, you know, all the learning difficulties and the neurodiversities, you know, are being considered. Yeah. What sort of supports do you think would have been helpful when you were in primary or secondary school? Now with your understanding of yeah. the difficulties and the challenges and how yeah. you coped yourself. Yeah, and you see, that's a very challenging question. I suppose leave aside medication because medication would have helped me hugely. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, medication would have helped hugely with the inattention and the impulsivity. Um, I think as well my classmates knowing i mean what they would say i, I just try to remember at stanford that they say people with neurodiverse conditions generally often need more time at examinations or uh, they might need more time now here's the thing like i didn't i didn't have any of this so it's very hard for me 
to speak, except to say that I would have benefit, benefited from medication. I would have benefited from some type of a strengths assessment. I would have benefited from mindfulness. Uh, I would have benefited by the class and the teacher knowing what I had and them knowing what to watch out for. Um, I would have, the other thing I would have benefited by is the teacher agreeing that every half an hour that I have it, mm -hmm. that I can have a 10 minute break. That's a big one for me uh, because I do everything in sports. Um, what else would I say? Yeah, of course. I mean, for me, again, in, an, in a Nirvana world, would I, I'd have a kind of a yoga ball to sit on rather than a, de rather than a chair. But like I'm speaking, Fiona, like this is all Nirvana. Uh, mm -hmm. I suppose a place for exercise, nature nearby, access to mindfulness, access to music. In my 15 minutes, access to music would be useful. And also the thing that really helps me a huge amount with executive functioning is the ability to have a, a, a notepad at all times in my life, everywhere, so that I can externalize stuff that takes the cognitive load in other words, mm -hmm. that everywhere I go, I can just write stuff down because my working memory is very uh, small mm -hmm. so that I have to keep writing stuff down to, to externalize the cognitive load of having it. Um, that's that's interesting, Ronan, because at the moment um, I can see how iPhones personally are so very useful for to do lists and alarms to remind you what time to come on and yeah. go to a meeting. Do, do you worry that, you know, some educators are uh, very very reluctant to include um, gadgets yeah. and technology yeah, so, into the classroom. Yeah, so here's the thing, right, about that. That's a, There's two sides to that, right? I do recommend, I highly recommend use of pen, pencil, or whatever. Paper and pen, I highly, highly recommend that for dealing with executive functioning. I, I think the timer is good. Um, the other tech things that I would use, especially over the last two years, are a voice to text device. I use Otter AI, but I think a voice to text device, I would have learned so much faster at school had I had a voice to text device. In other words, the teacher agrees that I can bring my Otter, my Apple iPhone into the, into the class. I turn on Otter and literally the teacher agrees with me that I don't need to look at him talking and all mm -hmm. I'm going to do is look at my iPhone and see, watch in words what he's saying, because that means that my inattention doesn't cause problems. I would have, I would have, I would have learned 10 times faster had I had the voice text voice. So voice text device, Google documents I find very useful. And uh, I find timers very good. But I would say, other than, I would say, other than what I've just spoken about there, I would recommend minimize technology, minimize it, mm. because mm. it can be a source of distraction, a huge source of distraction. Plus, <clears throat> in terms of exec executive, executive functioning, that we can, we so, we have so little of a working memory that when you start to add tech, you've got to really be so careful about what you add mm. because it can't be overload. So yes, I will take on board voice to text, Google Docs and timers, but I won't take on much more because of what it does is overloads my working memory. And it's very interesting. You were saying that for you, the visual is very important, that it kind of helps focus your attention. Yeah. And of course, you have individuals who might have nonverbal learning issues where, um, you know, auditory, uh, you know, may be as important as the visual. So, yeah. And here's the thing, again, about, aud here's the thing about auditory that I made a big mistake for a long time that I thought I had an auditory processing delay. I thought, right? But I, I got tested maybe six months ago, and it turns out I don't have an auditory processing delay. And what the reason I was struggling with auditory was this, that because of my inattention, so you can imagine me listening to when, before I had the medication, listen to a lecture, and literally my, I'm inattentive every second. So that was, it's like what I'm, my ability to hear is being disrupted by my inattention. So I, what I thought was an auditory processing delay wasn't. It was the fact that my inattention was causing me to struggle with, 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 with hearing. One other tool I forgot to mention that's really important. I learned this from a, a professor at the business school. I learned this last year at the business school. Sorry, 2019 was a, a professor called Frank Flynn at the business school. He taught me an approach that a guy, he called it, the approach of David Allen. 
And what David Allen, the David Allen approach to receiving emails is, he called it deleted, delegated, do it or date it. So in other words, every time you get an email, the first question is, do you delete it? If you can delete it. If you don't delete it, then you see, can I delegate this? And if, if you can't delegate it, then the next thing is, can I do this quickly? And if the thing is, if the answer is no, well, then I have to date a time when I get it done. So I think that's a brilliant, simple device that Frank taught me. And I think it's really good for ADHDers. But going back to your point, but the reason I talk the importance of notebooks and pads of paper and writing all the time is that there's about four or five reasons. I'm just trying to remember some of them. One is about externalizing the cognitive load and taking it out of working memory. The second reason, though, is to process to process what you're actually taking in. It's a real help to process, especially with emotions, because, as you know, Fiona, regulating emotions, ADHD is all about regulation. So I find that by writing everything, you're able to spot as a non taught me to circle my emotions, feelings, when I write down to circle the ones that, that are feelings. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Ronan, so, yeah. Ronan a, a quick question that just very much relates to the technology concerns you had from one of the audience was, do you think there's any way that you could approach some of the tech companies to see if they'd make ADHD friendly social apps, yeah, well, social media apps. Well, see, some of them, yeah, it's funny. I always feel in myself there's, I did talk to a lot of companies and actually there's a lot of companies like Google, Apple, who've got these great accessibility departments. Salesforce has one, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and they all make their products more accessible to everybody with different learning abilities, right? So whether you're blind or hearing or whatever. But I'm not sure about ADHD because when I think about myself, um, yeah, the only ones I use, the ones I love are the voice text and Google Docs and the, and the timer. But like, honestly, like I'm not sure, with everything I've learned about my ADHD over the last 30 years, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what else would make me really functional. Maybe something that somebody said in the chat there, maybe some, somebody to time like, how long have I talked? Like, have I been talking for more than 15 minutes, but for more than 15 seconds about this topic, then to stop me? I don't know, because to, it's anything to manage and cope with that inattention, you know? But I feel, I don't know, it's, I'd love yeah. if there was more technology, but I, I'd always be weighing up the, the benefit of the technology against what's going to do to my working memory and executive function. Mm. Well, I know Plona, Gavin, and myself did some research with a medical student some years back on ADHD. Is there an app for this? And whilst there's a number of apps out there, the issue is that really there wasn't a consensus among the group as to what was helpful. And yeah. I think that um, it is the sorts of things some of the uh, audience are putting in. And like you've said, how long have I been on it? Yeah. Have I used it today? Is it yeah. helpful? And it's yeah. it's the same kind of apps that are being developed for, whether it's your Fitbit. I'm yeah. addicted myself yeah. at the moment to steps. It's amazing. No, I know. My, but here's... Yeah, My but here's insomnia has been cured by it. Yeah, but you know, I would highly recommend to minimize tech solutions, honestly, and to rely on pads of paper. There's a there's a there's a, a device. A friend of mine is ADHD. He used a device called Google Keep. Google Keeps. I think it's similar to Google Docs. And then there's a writer friend of mine who's ADHD, and she uses a tool called Notion. I don't know. She used it. To, yes. it's a, I, I've never heard of that, but I would it's recommend. A, it's, a, it's an organizer. Is it? Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's kind of like a study organizer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think here's the thing. I've kind Ronan. of. Sorry. I've, I've, I just know what works best for me. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Ronan, we're getting close to the end, and I want to ask you one or two more questions. Yeah. Uh, and one of them, again, is coming from a question in terms of. Um, uh, the benefit of a diagnosis versus not getting one, but also are there supports or what supports are there are there out there for adults from your perspective? Yeah. I'm, I so, might add to that at the end. Yeah, so without question, 100%, absolutely, everybody should get diagnosed who, let's say, has a reason to be diagnosed. I, I, I would never, I would highly recommend that nobody, you know, put their, put their head in the sand everybody should know about the way their brain works. So that's that answer. The second answer is, 
that the things that really help me are mindfulness. There's a mindfulness app I think that's very good. Every anything, anything to calm down, calm down the emotions, calm you down is really good. But so the, 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 if somebody came to me and says, I'm, I've just been diagnosed, I say, okay, get an ADHD coach, get, you know, if you need therapy from somebody who's an expert, uh, get that. Um, what else? Therapy, an ADHD coach, you need to carve out a good job role, tell the people at work, explain some of the things you might need, for example, a digital organizer. Um, Maybe the main things, yeah. I mean, there's so much you can do nowadays, and it's become it's becoming more and more known in the workplace. And strengths assessment is very important, very very important. Everything that's based on strengths assessment. Um, one last thing, I'm say, one last thing about getting diagnosed. Yeah, absolutely get diagnosed. And you you just the world's moving in a in a place where people are beginning to see that people with different brain fun brain types of brains are, are are valuable so i think hopefully we're living in the, in, a, in a much better era if oh I yeah sorry sorry just... last thing, sorry, last thing to say is, is i developed a kind of a, a private like there's about 25 of people i've met over the last two years an adhd group uh but i know some of them use a website called ad add attitude a website called add attitude it's really good mm. uh, if i could just to add to that, uh, based on some of the questions here, Ronan, from yeah. a clinical perspective, the lack of services in Ireland. Yeah. Um, there is a national clinical program for ADHD now um, run by the College of Psychiatrists and HSE. Oh. And I certainly would suggest that anybody who's struggling to get in that diagnosis, there's no harm in contacting that service and saying, look, I'm still struggling. Oh, Let yeah. me know where it is and how can I access the service? and talking yeah. with your GP. And of course, Ken Kilbride there from the ADHD had Ireland, you know, it might have been predominantly children and families before. Yeah. But it's probably increasingly yeah. providing a very helpful signposting and educational information for adults. Yeah. Um, I'm going to end with one last question to you, Ronan, yeah. is, um, you know, we're aware of the, obviously we've been talking about some of the difficulties and challenges with ADHD, especially yeah. if you are put in that peg. Um, but talking about the strengths, which are so numerous, and uh, you have brought many of them to the fore today in terms of what you've been able to do, how well you've achieved in your professional role, how you've taken that on and you're having this momentum and advocacy role. Can you tell me a little bit about where to next for you? And what of that could you give credit to your ADHD apart to your wonderful self? I yeah. don't know if you can separate the two. <laughs> well, I would say, Fiona, <laughs> without question, I mean, and hopefully when, my, when I get my memoir published at the end of the year, I think anybody who will look at my memoir or look at my life would say, you know something, there's no question, all the things you did in life, all the really big things and all the, all the mistakes are all the really big things. I would say people could say, oh yeah, that's down to ADHD. So I've no doubt that the things I achieved in life were because of ADHD. That's the first thing. Uh, what next for me? So I've dedicated, well, this year I'm trying to, as I say, get this memoir. So does anybody, not just with ADHD or dyslexia or anybody could read my memoir and pluck out, you know, the, the 15 lessons that they think are relevant to them. So I suppose that's part of my, advocacy work and then I still do about five hours a week companies mainly in America still contact me through ND gifts and said oh Ronan can you give us some advice about this and that so I do about five hours a week on that but I, my hope is in the medium term maybe from next week after I get the memoir done that I'm trying to spread the word in AIB as well but what I'm trying to do is promote it right across especially the big companies in America, because they can roll it out. Like when I was talking to the people at Microsoft, they were saying, actually, people at Microsoft, LinkedIn, and Amazon were all saying that they were going to try and spread this work into their Irish operations. So that's the advantage to working with those big companies, let's say, in the States. So, But I'm available to talk to anybody. I try to dedicate about five hours a week to it. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, Ronan, I'm hoping that I'm, I could ask you at the end of this, I know the slides will be available that you yeah. had, that maybe you might yeah. 
make sure that the various references you mentioned there mm -hmm. by way of you know the useful mm -hmm. apps and yeah um, they're, they're all there you know organize oh yes yes so that we will make that we will make that available on our websites to individuals yeah, yeah. The recording the recording will be available as well um, and yeah. by registration you get a copy and just to say to the audience if anybody is struggling to get that please do email either uh, chas at ucd.ie or uh, get in touch with the UCD Neurodiversity Project. And um, Roland, I've come to the end of our presentation. It's time. amazing how time flies yeah. when you're enjoying yourself. Yeah. yeah, well, I basically, Fiona, my Thanks. slides plus hopefully what I said today is basically me distilling like my whole life's lessons. So hopefully it'd be helpful to- Yeah, but well, we look forward to we we'll look forward, it will indeed, and we look forward to um, encouraging you to finish those memoirs so that uh, we'll be able to, to read them as well. I know that can often be the procrastination and the deadlines. It yeah, will well, often be something uh, that's hard. Yeah. Well, listen, give my regards yeah. to Connor, and I look forward to, I'll be staying in touch anyway, but yeah, thanks so much for being invited, yeah. We're, we're delighted to invite you, and uh, we will... Um, indeed stay in touch with you because uh, in UCD we're very passionate about trying to make sure we make a difference obviously yeah. both um, in the university level but through the academic world infiltrating yeah. and making sure that workplace and schools um, yeah. happen. Can you know, I remind I, everybody um, of the yeah. next um, master class? Yeah go ahead Ronan. Go say sorry one last thing I think Ireland's in a great in, position. The next master So you go ahead. Yes. I was going to say that Ireland. Okay, Ireland and then I'll leave the last word to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you and Ronan, come in so and I'll finish. Okay. So what I was going to say is we in Ireland, I think, have a great chance because of the presence of these multinational American companies and because of the, I suppose, the links with Stanford, like we have a great chance to kind of make an impact on this you know, throughout Europe. And so I, I'd just be doing everything I, I can and I hope people on this call will actually be encouraged because I think we're, we're in a great place to make a big impact. And so ultimately it'll all be to the benefit of the kids and the next generation. Sorry, Fiona, that's it now, once more. Uh, thanks, Ronan. So that, there's a list of our next series of masterclasses. We'd be delighted if you would join us. And um, thanks very much to all of you for attending. I apologize, I, I wasn't great at multitasking and looking at the questions. Um, it, it might, I, I hope that at least the conversation covered many of them. And thank you for all the comments in between. All the best, everybody. Stay safe. And